as is becoming somewhat standard as of late, it's time for us to take a look at another new director. At least, a new director for the channel. Today we're spotlighting perhaps the biggest film by filmmaker Yusuke Hamaguchi. It's arguably his biggest film in terms of impact and reception. It is definitely his biggest film in terms of runtime. It's happy hour. Ryusuke Hamaguchi is a young filmmaker who has been working now for just over 10 years. Graduating from the University of Tokyo before moving on to the Tokyo University of Arts for graduate school, Hamaguchi's filmmaking was tied directly to his schooling. In fact, his first feature, 2008's Passion, served as a product of his master's program at Tokyo University. The film took off, garnering many awards and nominations right off the bat, as many of his films would go on to do. Since 2008, Hamaguchi has remained a bit more experimental than many of the more commercial directors we've covered here on the channel. This is something which definitely bears repeating with today's topic, if only by virtue of its immense length. What's more, Hamaguchi has remained remarkably prolific, producing seven films in the first ten years of his career. These include the novel adaptation of Asako 1 and 2 from 2018, a trilogy of documentaries released in 2013 concerning the aftermath of the March 11, 2011 tsunami and earthquake, and Happy Hour, a five-and-one-half-hour project concerning a quartet of emotionally disconnected women as they grow into middle age within modern Kobe. In 2013, Hamaguchi served as a resident artist in the Kito Design and Creative Center in Kobe. Here, he worked with amateurs as he led acting workshops for those without any experience. It was in this environment that the seeds for Happy Hour germinated. In fact, many of the actors in today's film met Hamaguchi for the first time at Kito, and were recruited for the film through his workshops. To further drive this home, we would point to how none of the main four women have any other credits to their name, besides the European re-release of Happy Hour under the title Senses 1-5. through Five. In spite of, or perhaps because of, the raw amateur power Hamaguchi was able to find in these actors, Happy Hour has won multiple international awards and ended up landing on several best of the decade lists as of late. Happy Hour saw its initial release in 2015, with festival appearances surrounding this date. As mentioned before, it was re-released in Europe in 2018 as Senses 1 through 5, five hour-long segments of the film which, as far as we know, don't add or subtract any content. More importantly for our North American viewers, the film was released in 2017 by independent distributor Kim Stim, who were gracious enough to provide us a review copy of the film. Kim Stim picked up the film for release on DVD, Blu-ray, and digital platforms including Amazon Prime. Truly, unless the runtime is a major stumbling block, you owe it to yourself to check out this sleeper hit. It's a gut punch of drama, examining four slices of life and how they intersect in a palpable, poignant manner. Be sure to check it out, and to support Kim Stim for bringing this one stateside. Once you've seen the film, be sure to come back and give our video a look, as we dive into what we believe to be the main components of Happy Hour. As we said, Happy Hour is a five and one half hour slice of life picture, concerning four women and their lives as they transition from adulthood into middle age. We explore their trials, their struggles, and their triumphs as they work to define themselves in the modern world. They're not just grappling with the world, of course, as they're primarily coming to grips with their personal identities in their older, wiser, more mature station in life. In this way, we would argue that the first theme of Happy Hour relates to what we might call the ephemeral art of life. After a brief period of getting to know our four main women, Fumi, Akari, Jun, and Sakurako, we begin to see how their lives and the lives of their respective families overlap. This is explored through a few key moments where all four women come together for various events, while in between we break off and follow each woman in turn. In other words, we cut directly into their lives in real time and follow them at a steady pace before exiting the scene as an audience. It's a true slice of life in Kobe. The first of these points of contact between the main four is a workshop about which one would be forgiven for asking whether or not it was inspired by Hamaguchi's work as a resident artist. In this instance, the women, and several others, bond over a workshop hosted by one of them, Fumi. 
where an eccentric seeming man named Ukai teaches the participants how to bond with people on a deep level. In a half hour sequence, we follow the man as he explains how he traveled to Kobe as a relief volunteer following an earthquake. Amidst the rubble he found there, he began standing these broken pieces up on the beach. He relates this to the human experience, offering that this transient art he worked with was all about finding a center of gravity amidst ruin. Ukai explains that he became a local legend and artist thanks to this, yet he quickly grew tired of the fame. He began to pine for something more important and fulfilling. The daily winds on the beach knocked down the debris composing his gravity-defying art, and he realized he needed to impact people more permanently. This, in turn, led to beginning these workshops. Following this explanation, we listen along with the women to Ukai as he guides them through esoteric methods of connecting with one another. He instructs them to walk in circles, keeping their centers aligned. At another point, they sit back to back and raise each other up in pairs and groups. Later, Ukai tells them to place foreheads together and try to transmit words between each other. That might seem like a long-winded explanation for a single scene, but there's a reason for that. Ukai's workshop takes up more or less the second half of the film's first hour. The remains of the film play out in much this same way. We're shown relatively short interludes where we learn more about the characters of these women through their words and their actions. These interludes are then punctuated by half-hour sequences, Ukai's workshop, or a book reading, where the audience is allowed to ponder and meditate on how this longer piece reflects what we've seen about each character up to now. Through this framing, Happy Hour is able to show a deeply affecting portrait of differing perspectives in life through the lens of modernity. We're not examining the human condition through a period piece, where the length of time between the film's setting and our own age may help us emotionally remove ourselves from being affected. Instead, we're shown snippets of these people's lives, as we might with friends who we see a few times a week and were then invited to more or less the full duration of certain central events where all the participants converge. Furthering this immersion, Happy Hour stylistically tricks us into believing its narrative, in how time is entirely linear through its runtime. That is to say, there are no flashbacks, only memories. Just like in real life, anecdotes are told by the characters, not shown. This, of course, breaks the typical logic of storytelling, show, don't tell. But it also heightens immersion by sticking to how situations would literally play out. In this way, Happy Hour is subtle in how it portrays the lives and interactions of these women and the secondary characters who overlap with them. Thankfully, given how true to life the resultant film is, Happy Hour never overstays its welcome, nor does it become boring, instead being a huge project one might simply fall into. The second, arguably most important theme upon which Happy Hour touches is communication. Specifically, we see how communication breaks down or becomes muddied the older we get and the longer we know people. How, ironically, those that we know least well are the ones with whom we can have the most truthful, unbridled communication. Effectively, it's both a record of modern life and a warning to not fall into the same pitfalls as the characters we follow here. The film is somewhat like Ukai in this way, coming at us in an eccentric manner, perhaps appearing as a bit of a weirdo to some, but ultimately trying to tell us to just speak with one another. Perhaps the most direct example of how Happy Hour approaches the deterioration in communication between those who are close is one of the film's lengthier pieces. As we learn fairly early on, one of our protagonists, Jun, is going through the legal proceedings required to divorce her husband, Kohei Hino. We're told that she has fallen out of love with Hino, and that she has cheated on him. Hino, however, has forgiven her adultery and is opposed to her wanting a divorce. Halfway into the film, the three other women appear at a hearing where Jun is questioned by Hino's lawyer. Everyone else, the women, the judge, and Hino himself, remains silent throughout this piece. Meanwhile, the husband, who purports to love Jun, speaks through a lawyer to bring her back to him. Instead of settling this in private, or being able to reconcile their differences, they've come to this moment in time where Hino sees it as necessary and acceptable to rope Jun back in through the legal prowess of his lawyer. This itself represents a breakdown in communication though it's driven home in how the scene is presented visually. Though June is providing 
her side of the story, she's being denied a voice or agency by her husband and his lawyer. Though June speaks at length here, she's fuzzy, and the ever-silent Hino is held in perfect focus. We also see this side of things explored further when Hino approaches June in person at her apartment. She doesn't want him there, but knows that she must at least humor him. Their communication has continued to break down in a stalemate. Together, the two are silhouetted against the skyline, showing the audience that this is the dark side of modern life. Hino claims he loves her no matter what, yet outright refuses to care about what she wants, that being whether or not she loves him or wants to be with him. The conversation comes to a head when June states that she has spent nearly a decade alone. Her husband has only shown interest in her now that they are living apart. She thinks he views her as an object or a conquest, while he continues to demand that his controlling actions are born out of love. In short order, Hino's designs for June succeed legally, but fail practically. He has the judge deny her motive for a divorce, meaning that she must remain married to him in spite of her wishes. We say this fails practically as June almost immediately flees, catching a ferry away from Kobe, disappearing out of the movie and everyone's lives. This represents another wrinkle in the poor communication between June and Hino. Prior to escaping, June admits that she's been so desperate that she has been lying in court about her affair and their relationship. In other words, for half of the film, it appears that the differences between Hino and June are irreconcilable, primarily thanks to Hino's demands on June and his refusal to let her go. Later, however, we hear the husband's side of things. In one of the longer scenes, this time being a dinner after party following another art exhibit, we are suddenly presented with the reality that we saw this entire situation from June's perspective only. As a result, without a second thought, we were made to hate Hino. To see him as heartless, controlling, and maybe even sociopathic. Now he is finally provided an opportunity to air his grievances with June publicly. We've only seen him in scenes with June, and she has had no interest in hearing from him. Here, Fumi and Sakurako are willing to hear him out. As a result, we're slapped with the reality that Hino makes some good points and some bad points, just like June, making us realize after a slow build that no one is 100% in the right or the wrong here. In Hino's case, he appeals to how love is an illogical beast. He argues that he cannot deny his true emotions. Hino wants to be there for June, sounding almost like a good husband. All of his responses are provided directly, without Hino even having to consider why he feels one way or another. He never raises his voice, speaking measuredly and calmly. It's easy in this moment to see how, were we able to have known Hino first, rather than June, we likely would have sympathized with him and much more. Instead, we're forced to realize that our own contempt for Hino may not have been wholly justified. We may have been wrong, as neither of them are completely wrong or right. Running concurrent to this point-counterpoint, we follow Fumi, the woman who helps run the artist space, which hosts Ukai among others. Fumi is married to a man who does editorial work for writers, his latest client being a 25-year-old woman named Mrs. Nose. As you might already imagine, Fumi's relationship with her artistic husband is equally strained when compared with Jun's and Hino's, even if it hasn't been strained to the point of breaking just yet. In fact, it's their own dysfunction which provides the opportunity for the after-party dinner, during which we see the aforementioned conversation between Hino, Sakurako, Fumi, Fumi's husband, and Miss Snose. Similar to how we first met Hino by proxy of June, we're at first introduced to Miss Nose in brief through Fumi's eyes. Nose needs to attend a hot spring for research for some upcoming stories. The four main women were already planning a trip to Arima, meaning that Fumi's husband and Nose end up piggybacking on the trip. He offers to drive everyone in his van but promises not to hover with Fumi and her friends. Instead, he plans to have a separate trip at the same time with Nose, seeing no problem with this. Cutting through the whole situation here, you might already detect the problem with Fumi and her husband, where Hino actively ignored Jun's wants and overrode them with his own. Fumi's husband is more or less oblivious to Fumi's discomfort. He's so unaware, in fact, that he's taken aback when he suggests Nose as an artist for Fumi's art space, only to have Fumi blow up on him before acquiescing and accepting the idea. 
Later, the fruits of Miss Nose's labors are offered up at an event Fumi's husband more or less talked Fumi into hosting, a reading of a prototype short story by Nose, based upon her experiences in Arima. What is read here in long form reveals Nose to be equal parts precocious and naive, which is not an unfair criticism given her relative youth compared with Fumi and the others. Following the reading, Ukai is meant to host a Q&A session, to delve into Nose's inspirations for her provided story. Ukai bows out without telling anyone, meaning that a replacement is needed. Oblivious as ever to how it might make others uncomfortable, Fumi's husband then selects Hino as Ukai's replacement. During the dinner with the others after the reading and Q&A, Hino provides direct criticism to Nosei's outlook on life, as shown in her story. This series of events shows Fumi's husband's lack of awareness. Not once are we shown that he has considered how platforming both Nose and Hino could affect the rest of the group. By extension, this pair-up leads to the scene we keep mentioning, where Fumi's discontent as well as Hino's perspective on June are offered. It's uncomfortable, to say the least. Regardless, during Hino's criticism of her work as immature, Nose admits that she tries to remove herself as much as she can from her works. Hino then shoots back that she appears clearly throughout the story she's just read. Part of the story dealt with a subtle romance narrative, which Hino calls out quickly as ringing false. In other words, Nose has never truly been in love. This is expressed through her inability to write about love. You may be quick to see the irony here, as the one to call this out is Hino, who knows exclusively about his own type of love, not the storybook ideal, even if none of us like what his take on love entails. This interaction presents us with another dimension regarding communication breaking down. Miss Nose is attempting to be truthful while hiding herself from her work. She thinks she is removing herself from the writing, but is criticized for being inseparable from it. Nose cannot communicate in an earnest manner with the adults in the room, all of whom have experienced some form of love. As a result, they all look at her as a child, except perhaps Fumi's husband, who comes quickly to her rescue when Hino starts to talk down to her. This interaction, by extension, pushes things to a boiling point between Fumi and her husband. After this, Sakurako is the one to finally bring Fumi's discontent to her husband's attention. She asks him how he could never realize that Fumi was upset with how much time and attention her husband was devoting to a young woman who seems to have feelings for him. At this, he seems taken aback again, claiming he never detected these issues. Again, we would argue that the point here is how both Fumi and her husband are in the wrong. She should have said something, but he should have tried harder to understand her. In fact, it's arguable that this was telegraphed earlier during the trip to Arima. At a hot spring, Fumi commented to the other women that she worried about not being accepted by anyone if she were always completely forward about her feelings and thoughts. Fumi's husband is oblivious, while Fumi has been sacrificing herself for the acceptance of others. Unfortunately, the woman to present this, Sakurako, isn't herself in the best of positions with her own husband, Yoshihiko, and son, Daiki. As a housewife, Sakurako has arguably the most diverse home life of the four. She has a husband who appears to more or less ignore her, being forever at work or at the kitchen table with a newspaper, a son who is ungrateful to his parents given his age, and a mother-in-law with whom she genuinely connects over household manners. We observe that Sakurako and her mother-in-law are the closest, as she is the only person with whom Sakurako can commiserate about the worst parts of her husband. The mother gives parenting advice for dealing with both Yoshihiko and Daiki based on how she raised Yoshihiko. A few good whacks, more or less, and she says he was set straight. Daiki, meanwhile, is a teen who is bored, if not openly rebellious to his parents. The mother-in-law tells the parents at one point that Daiki has been bringing a young woman around when they've been out. Ultimately, Daiki gets this young woman pregnant. Rather than taking charge, Yoshihiko ignores the situation, meaning that Sakurako and her mother-in-law are made to clean this up. Daiki, upset by his parents' reactions, even tries to elope with the young woman. He's the final character to see Jun as he waits at a ferry port for the woman who, as it turns out, stands him up. 
Yoshihiko seems to more or less hold his tongue around Sakurako, appearing cold, distant, and perhaps disaffected. He's not the warm, loving husband Sakurako seems to want him to be, instead being extremely paternalistic toward her. In fact, rather than approaching Sakurako about her apparent discontent with domestic life, Yoshihiko instead tells the women that they need to leave Sakurako alone until her mood improves. In this way, he labels them bad influences, meaning he's treating his own wife more or less like a child. In spite of acting paternal, even to his own wife, Yoshihiko places more burden on her than she thinks is fair. At one point, it's explained that the family has taken on his mother when his sister refused to. He's portrayed as not being a part of the family's daily life, instead expecting everything to be ready for him on command. This means that it's a no-brainer for his mother-in-law to move in. From Sakurako's perspective, he likely thinks this is not his problem, so he's not bothered by it. Again, the film here explores how we see this as unfair, given that we're looking at it from Yoshihiko's and Sakurako's perspective, not accounting for any of his sister's needs or struggles. For all we know, she could have legitimate reasons to not take in their mother. To us though, this character we've only heard of, but never seen, is a shiftless lazybones. At the same time, Sakurako is shown to have a different struggle than Jun or Fumi in her home life. Here, a dimension is added by the introduction of a parent and a child, something that the others do not have, at least at present. There's a balance between Sakurako's discontent and Yoshihiko's rude nature, and the pride and fulfillment she receives from raising her family and being, in a way, the true head of the family. Events between Sakurako and Yoshihiko come to a head very late in the film, which we won't spoil given that they could be argued to be the true climax of the picture. We will say, however, that Sakurako's journey is perhaps the most subtle of the four, simply given how much more complex her familial web is. The final of the four women, Akari, has already been through a divorce. Where Jun is proceeding through one, and Fumi and Sakurako go through trying times, Akari comes into the film on her own. Of the four, she is easily the most hardened, even saying she's too light on her subordinate nurse at work, in spite of chewing her out for more than half of their shared screen time. In a phrase, it would seem that Akari has been burned and that her emotional skin has not just thickened, but calloused. Halfway in, this mentality ends up getting her injured, as she breaks a leg falling down the stairs after storming away from the latest chew-out session with her subordinate. Akari spends the first chunk of the film more or less brooding about, with a few light moments cropping up here and there. Later, however, Ukai and his sister are instrumental in trying to pry Akari's death grip away from her emotions. This handle on her self-portrayal even extends metaphorically beyond her emotions. She complains after Ukai's workshop about needing liability insurance as a nurse. In her words, this and the bureaucracy of the medical industry keep her from providing the care she wants to provide, given her passion for healthcare. Akari wants to be a softer person, but she's been so hurt that she sees no path forward for herself professionally or emotionally other than being as gruff and straightforward as possible. Up to now, we are also shown that Akari has been seeing another, presumably, divorced man with a daughter. These are those moments of brightness we mentioned a moment ago, as these are the few points during which we see Akari smiling and seemingly comfortable in her own skin. She seems to think that she can find happiness in a traditional marriage and family, the very setup that hurt her in the first place. At her root, however, she and we learn that there are character and boundary issues with others that she has never addressed. In short, she has tried to protect herself by closing herself off. These issues, as Ukai and his sister show, must come to a head for her to truly pursue happiness in any real capacity. If not happiness, she needs to address these issues to achieve any sense of fulfillment. In other words, Akari is going through the motions without even a family like Sakurako, to feel some sense of fulfillment. She's angry, and needs to learn to redirect her energy and ambitions to grow as a person and to truly bond with others. As you can hopefully see, this second theme of happy hour, communication, runs throughout all four of these plots. All of them are predicated on some type of communication issue. Jun is not being heard by her husband. Fumi's husband is oblivious, though she's also not talking to him. Sakuroko's husband acts more like a father than a lover, and Akari is stumbling through her adult life toward a lonely future thanks to her coldness. 
By the conclusion of the film's runtime, you'd be forgiven for wanting to yell at the screen that all of these people just need to talk to one another. You get the feeling that this might solve all of the issues presented through each character. In turn, this perception leads directly to what we consider the third theme of Happy Hour, that being connection between adults. Not communication, mind you, but genuine connection. As we see in how the events of Happy Hour are framed, as seen in each of the four stories in the previous section, the film plays out like being brought into a group of friends. This helps us explore how these various characters connect with one another, though admittedly we're coming from a very biased perspective. The narrative unfolds so that for the first few hours we get to know the four women first, which makes us want to side with them in spite of their flaws. Once we branch out and begin to explore other characters more, however, we start to see these blemishes in new lights. People we hated become people with whom we can empathize, or at least sympathize, and our faves become flawed, real people. Just like with a group of friends, we want so badly to stand the people we were introduced to first, prioritizing them over those we see as outsiders. Yet we're forced to realize that's probably not fair to the others. We are also asked at points to consider who we side with amongst the main four. When June tells Sakuriko, but not Akari, nor us, about her adultery, we're made to feel left out, and given that we know Akari has been cheated on, we might side against Jun here, until we learn more about Jun's situation. When the women leave Arima, June lingers behind temporarily, kicking off her road trip away from Hino. Shortly, she boards a bus and encounters a woman who earlier took a group photo of the women. The woman explains the shifting of perspectives and the confusion of adult connections best. She states that our perspectives are hard to change, and that cognitive dissonance is likely easier than accepting the harsh truths present in adult life. This is shown in how she was told as a kid that her grandfather had moved to Osaka. Her parents were softening the blow of his death, and she continued holding on to this idea long after we might think she should have grown out of it. Even when old enough to know he was dead, she still couldn't comprehend it when told directly by another relative. Again, the cognitive dissonance of knowing somewhere in her heart that he was dead, but claiming he simply moved was easier than true acceptance. In much the same way, Happy Hour acts as a litmus test of how forgiving the audience is for their favorite and most relatable characters. This is further exemplified in how Ukai and his sister are introduced. Ukai is shown as the leader of the eccentric workshop to help adults connect with one another. His sister, meanwhile, is not revealed to be his sister until very late into the film. However, we meet her during the workshop when she criticizes his class, saying that it was confusing and likely pointless. We assume at this point, and in the diner afterward, that she's a rando who joined his class on a whim. Thus, not knowing her, we believe her criticisms are genuine and unbiased. Learning late into the film that they are siblings, this recontextualizes her harsh words. We're made to ask then if this was good-natured ribbing as a sister, or a statement from the film on how we can say these things to family, yet not to friends. In the long run, these two offer a remarkably different take on human connection when compared with the four main women. Between Ukai and his sister, communication doesn't break down, which is implied to be due to their familial nature. Again, this is never made clear. Is it because they're family, or because they've taken the time to truly connect? This is something which Akari actively misunderstands when asking late in the film why the sister is so close to Ukai. In other words, she's incapable of bonding this way and struggles to understand how someone else can. In fact, this lack of true connection extends to all four of our leads, all of whom seem to be in the early stages of proto-midlife crisis. As we explained in the section on communication, none of the women are truly satisfied with their stations in life. Yet, in spite of this, they've found some sense of connection with one another. The opening scene of the film shows a group of 30-somethings who have known one another for half their lives in some cases, all commiserating on how their families don't appreciate them. Rather, they have to rely on one another for support. In spite of the poor weather just outside their picnic shelter, the four women are seen complimenting each other's foods. They even compare the rainy atmosphere atop this mountain to their outlook on life going forward, murky, misty, and impenetrable. They're not shown to be at the point of crisis yet, 
but they're well on the way if their connections with others are not strengthened preemptively. At the same time, all of these women are dutiful to family, work, or whatever they perceive as leading to happiness. This is shown to the point that they attempt to coordinate their busy calendars, meaning their next major group outing will come in several months rather than several weeks or several days. We're made to ask if these connections are helpful for them, if they benefit those with whom the women don't connect truly. Instead, it's as though we're supposed to hope that they will form truer bonds with other humans rather than abstractions, or people who don't appreciate them. Visually, the film explains this to us, showing the moments when true connections form in a particular way. During these connection points, we move from the role of third-party observer to being in the direct line of fire, with each connectee facing us heads-on, and the camera swapping a full 180 degrees to allow us access to both sides of a deep conversation. This happens with Fumi and her friends when she discovers her discontent at expressing her true self, as well as with Hino and the others when he grills Nose for being naive. Not to mention June on the bus leaving Arima when she discusses her and another woman's life stories. These are but a few examples of this subtle trick being employed within Happy Hour, while other examples pepper the film. This visual device mirrors Ukai's workshop, where during one exercise he tells the participants to align their centers with one another and circle in unison. The idea is to find one center, then connect it with the partner, and to remain in sync despite being in motion. This is perhaps the most important activity developed by Ukai, compared especially with the brainwave connection he attempts to teach later. As we observe with Fumi, Jun, Sakurako, and Akari, psychic connections do not happen. Perhaps Ukai is using this as a metaphor to ask his students to consider their communication and connection skills in the abstract. What we may argue the film is really getting at here is how we must speak with one another to be heard, hence the direct approach during these moments of genuine connection. We're not seeing psychic connections without verbalization as Ukai idealizes. Instead, these are moments of genuine speech and genuine hearing, where two individuals have aligned their centers, and thus can connect. On a more basic level, these types of connections between adults are also explored in the after-workshop dinner outing we referenced previously. Here, the adults comment on how, as kids, they had physical contact with one another for no reason other than fun. They reminisce on games similar to Patty Cake, which had no real purpose other than to encourage laughter. As adults, however, they postulate that they only touch others when they want to. This could be linked back, in a non-physical way, to why we have different perspectives for June and Hino. The adults say that they touch out of wanting, just as with this married couple, there's no compromise, no doing things for other people, no doing things without reason, nor simply throwing caution to the wind. Everything they do is meant for self-satisfaction, not for its own sake. This scene explains, by contrast, that sometimes it feels good to touch another person for no reason. Late in the film, this idea is brought back up when multiple characters talk about having sex with strangers, or having sex with people for no reason. Akari bears the brunt of this conversation when she scoffs at Ukai's sister for having sex with people she's never met. Akari, the most outwardly closed off person, cannot fathom taking actions without purpose, instead seeking the more adult view of cause and effect, and needing a logical reason to do anything or enter into any relationship. Sex is here used as an extreme example, as anonymously it represents learning to be less guarded in one's most vulnerable state. Throughout the film, this theme is built up, from the dinner scene to this conversation between Akari and Ukai's sister, that it may do us some good to act like kids without cause for concern, yet how something always holds us back. The film seems to argue that the very thing holding back true connection in this regard is the social pressure placed on us as adults. Happy Hour shows that its characters maintain these walls due to expectations from others. They communicate instead mostly through small talk and platitudes. At one point, Akari gets mad at one of the other workshop attendees for saying that being a nurse must be hard. Akari says this is based on no knowledge whatsoever and is a vacuous statement meant to keep the conversation going. Rather than adding any valuable input to the discussion, the statement is meant to project concern and to avoid responsibility or interest. 
Throughout the film, we see these types of small talk and avoidance tactics as typical hallmarks of adult contact. Meanwhile, at the same time, a true bond is formed between Akari and a young man in the group, when they both open up about having been cheated on and subsequently divorcing their partners. This is a true connection, as shown in the visual moments throughout the remainder of the film, a rare moment amidst the multitude of small talk and platitudes offered between people avoiding genuine contact. Happy Hour more or less asks us, then, to throw caution to the wind every now and again and live as children might. It won't always be pretty, but it's a more satisfying way in which to live, and a more honest way in which to live. As you can hopefully see, Happy Hour is a deep, subtle, slow, brooding beast of a film. It's packed to the brim with nuance and theming, while seeming as though it simply trucks along for its runtime, which could fit within any typical film trilogy. Definitely check this one out if you haven't already. It might teach you something about yourself, human communication, connections, or the secret world of adults entering middle age. We cannot recommend this one highly enough, and we're more than excited to return later on to some of Ryusuke Hamaguchi's other directorial efforts. Let us know below what you think of Happy Hour and Hamaguchi's other films. Until next time, see what Happy Hour might have to teach you.